morning. It is Ask Dr. Ben. Um, and uh, yes, absolute lawnmower mayhem going on outside. So oh, I'm stuck inside. Yeah, this, this happens, I guess. <laughs> First question today is from Barb. Good morning, Barb. Um, so going around the web, um, so this is about the uh, bats and I'm guessing either the Wuhan or the North Carolina laboratory. Um, but let's, yeah, let's have a look. So bats were sent to the lab and the cells were infected with the virus were separated from ordinary cells by centrifuge, precipitation, etc. And the viral genome was then further studied. Yeah, that's the standard procedure if you wanted to uh, grow a bat virus. We're not great at uh, culturing bat viruses. Most of the viruses that have been discovered are viruses, rather virus sequences. Uh, we'll get the genome back in a lot of pieces, put it together um, from you know many overlapping pieces so we can be pretty sure of it. But most of these things have never actually been cultured and that is sometimes a little bit tricky to do. You'd have to test them out in a lot of different cell lines to get that to happen. Um, okay, and so further, the scientists uh, added catalysts and enzymes. Oh my gosh, to cause mutations in the DNA slash RNA. All right, it's an RNA virus. It has no DNA. <laughs> um, and there are ways you can do this. Uh, something like a 5-fluorouridine um, is a thing that you can put into cell culture to try and force um, a virus to make mutations. It's a risky thing to do because you'll usually kill your virus. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Um, tests like that are uh, useful in generating mutants of the virus that sometimes have interesting properties. But they're going to be maybe one or two nucleotides different, not a thousand nucleotides different uh, the way this new virus is different. Anyway, so... Um, this is referred to as manufacturing. No, nobody. <laughs> That's not referred to as that. It's a <laughs> random mutagenesis. And like I said, uh, random mutagenesis is usually bad. Um, remember the Spider-Man paradox? Lots of radiation, lots of damage. No Spider-Mans uh, yet. Spider-Man, I don't know. They can be men and women, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Among the human race, anyway. Um, yeah, mutation is not a path to success. Um, massive recombination can be a path to a success, and very long-term natural selection can also be a path to success uh, for a virus. So viruses out there, yeah, stay in school, yeah. <laughs> keep keep up with the natural selection, yeah. Uh, don't just mutate yourselves. That's, yeah, that's dumb. That's a dumb way to do stuff. Okay, so the question, anyway, let's get to the question is, um, so you probably addressed the, whether the coronavirus is lab created. Yeah, but uh, here's what's going around Facebook now. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Yeah. Facebook makes me tired sometimes. I'm not even on Facebook. I get it all secondhand, but it's just like secondhand smoke. It's still not good for you. And you're not even getting any of the benefit of being on it yourself. It's <laughs> just really bad. Um, so uh, question uh, regarding the um, uh, stuff above. Is it correct that labs can mutate um, the virus to mimic evolutionary changes? No. So, yeah. Um, all right. So you can put in chemicals that drive mutations. But what we know is that viruses have this thing called a mutation threshold or an error catastrophe cliff, if you like, which means that so viruses are going to deliberately make mistakes. They're actually tuned so that they make a certain number of mistakes because of a thing called fitness. So fitness is your ability to leave behind more offspring than, you know, Joe down the road, uh, Joe virus down the road. Uh, and so virus fitness is something that seems to be very strongly selected for. And this is a tricky subject. Uh, there's no one way to get to virus fitness. You have to have all of the machinery of the virus working in sometimes tip-top condition, sometimes a little bit less than tip-top condition um, because it's the entire population. It's all of the mutant viruses together that will either survive and be passed on or, um, yeah, or perish. And so viruses don't really work individually, or rather they're not selected individually. The selection tends to be more like a group selection uh, kind of concept. Um, yeah, and mutations do not increase uh, fitness beyond a th certain threshold. So if a virus makes certain mistakes, it's going to be able to make enough mistakes to evade the immune system, for example. And so that's going to be a good thing. 
and there'll be slight changes that a virus has to make to get into different kinds of cells or to do different kinds of tasks. There's like a best version of the virus for a lot of different things, but there's no one virus that is the best at everything. Yeah, because you can always optimize some component a little bit more, but usually, you know, turning one dial up ends up turning another dial down, basically. Yeah, the virus always pays a price when it uh, um, sort of moves away from its center of fitness. So it, it can be better in certain ways, but not better in a general way. Yeah, if that made any sense. <laughs> Um, so, what you can do in a lab, you can show that uh, uh, RNA viruses, at least the ones that have been studied well, have an error threshold of about five, which is when your virus is making an average of five mutations per genome, random mutations, the virus is dead. There's almost no virus that can survive more than five. What we've got here is a virus that has a thousand mutations. So SARS coronavirus 2 has about a thousand differences from the nearest relative in a bat. and while the virus can make mutations very quickly, most of those mutants are dead. And so the actual process of evolution where you put in mutations tends to be really slow. And it involves a lot of what we call natural selection, which is basically weeding out all the viruses that do not do well in the long term and leaving behind lots of virus offspring. And so, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's biological fitness. Um, yeah, it's a kind of a weird concept. Um, I think humanity have tried to substitute maybe uh, uh, money and social influence for some of this old uh, biological, you know, have as many babies as possible, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that works too. Uh, we're doing fine. <laughs> so yes, you can make mutations in a virus. No, you can't easily make a thousand mutations and have a virus that is still alive because the virus goes off a cliff at about five mutations and it might take you, well, it takes you about a year to find 30 mutations that can actually stay in the genome. And sometimes when you make one mutation, it'll open up the possibility to make two or three more and the virus just has to try everything and eventually it'll find these things that at least don't kill it, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's not like that, and if you mutate a virus, like I said, you're not going to get Spider-Man. You're not going to get a virus with superpowers. You're mostly going to get a dead virus. You're mostly going to get a worse virus. And the only way that they can change is very slowly over many, many years. And so 30 mutations a year, and we've got 1,000 mutations. You can do the back of the envelope math, but it's been a long time since this particular SARS coronavirus 2 was the same as its most closely related bat coronavirus. And just because people are growing other bat coronaviruses or looking at them, yeah, we know about that, but these things mostly don't grow in cell culture <laughs> at all. You can't grow them in a lab. And um, uh, they're, all so, they're all much more different than this one. So we haven't yet got a sequence of anything that is remotely close, that's even within five or 10 years evolutionary distance of SARS coronavirus 2. That pocket of viruses, when they find it, it won't just be one individual that has it. It'll be all kinds of related individuals in the same place. And uh, right now we are not particularly close to that pocket of virus, which is why people like me will take uh, some caution in saying, well, we know there are related bat viruses, related pangolin viruses, but we do not know exactly what host this definitely came from yet. We are just not quite close enough to the source. So. That's probably more explanation than you wanted, uh, but, uh, and I don't know how you're gonna translate that into a Facebook post that anybody is going to uh, understand or respond to, but that's pretty much uh, the idea. That's uh, the idea behind this. So thank you very much for a very, very long, very sorry about that, um, Ask Dr. Ben, and have a lovely day.